I want to do an example under the conditions of one dimension and constant acceleration. In particular, I'd like to use this example to demonstrate sort of a strategy in solving problems. The problem is this. A ball is thrown up at the same time another ball is dropped above it. They collide when the thrown ball has twice the speed of the dropped ball. Where do they collide? The first step is to clearly visualize what's going on. So I have some ball that's up high, another one that's low. This one is going to be thrown up, this one's going to be dropped, and then somewhere in the middle they're going to collide. As part of a picture in this visualization, I want a schematic, and schematics almost always have uh, coordinate systems. And a coordinate system requires a positive direction and a zero. I get to choose that. And so for this, I'm going to choose, absent anything else, zero to be at the point where the first ball is released, and I'm going to have positive x going up. At this point, I sort of moved on to the brainstorm section. And a lot of times I'll go back and forth. I might have to draw more pictures as I brainstorm a little bit. Part of the brainstorming part of solving the problem is going to be what sort of physics applies to this problem. What sort of model do I want? What sort of approximations am I going to make? Sort of the physics that applies. I think we've studied our constant acceleration equations, so I think we'll be using those. We're going to use the particle model. We're ignoring any sort of air resistance or any other acceleration other than the acceleration due to gravity. And so that's part of the approximation from our constant acceleration equations. Remember, these are derived equations. And what is key is that they only apply for two specific points in time. Part of our brainstorming approach to this problem is that we have to clearly identify in our mind what those two points in time are. The initial time to be the moment that each ball is released, and we'll call that our initial time, t is equal to zero. And then our final time is going to be the time when they collide. and so I don't have to write t sub f all the time. I'm just going to give that some constant t. This is now not an independent variable. This is a specific time t. It's the final time, the, the time when they collide. We have some physics that we're going to apply to the problem. We've got some approximations, model, all of those things. The next part of the brainstorming session is, is sort of what do you know, what do you not know? And by doing these things, then we can establish relationships between what we know and not know, and then once we have enough of them, we can move on to being able to solve the problem. We have our time interval. That's equal to t, right? That's just equal to tf minus ti. So we know that already. Let's go ahead and make lists for each uh, particle. I'm going to call this ball particle 1, this ball particle 2. OK, so for the first particle, let's determine what its initial position is. So I have x sub 1i. So initial position of particle 1. Well, from my coordinate system, I can see that that's 0. I'm also interested in the final position of particle 1. I'll call that x sub 1 f. And that's at the point where they collide. I'm going to go ahead and just call that x, because that's going to be an, an important uh, parameter. That's what I'm looking to solve for. So I, and it's going to be some value of x. I don't know exactly what it is, and so I'm going to call that. Again, this is not now an independent variable. It's the, the final position in x that I'm trying to solve for. The initial velocity is unknown. It says it's launched with something, but I don't know what that is. And the, oh, the, the initial velocity, sorry, is that I'll call v sub 1i. v sub 1f is its final velocity, and I don't know what that is either. I was told that the speed of 1 is twice the speed of 2, but exactly what that speed is I don't know, so I'll, I'll have to come to that later. And then finally I know the acceleration. The acceleration is constant. The magnitude of the acceleration is g. Acceleration is a vector, and so it has a direction. And to understand that direction, I have to go back to the coordinate system. The freefall acceleration direction is defined as toward the center of the Earth. And so with this coordinate system, A is pointing down in the negative x direction. And of course, there's the time, and the time is unknown. What do I know about particle 2? Where is its initial position? I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to say it starts out at some height. 
h. So again, this is the sort of thing you do. The problem didn't say particle 2 is dropped from a height h. I get to define the notation, and I'm going to define it in a way that it's meaningful to me. I call that particle 2, and I'm going to say it's dropped from a height h. Its final position is the same as the final position of 1, because the point in time I'm looking at is the point where they collide. To do this, I used the relationship that the final position of 1 is equal to the final position of 2. You know, this isn't a physics equation. You're not going to find this in the book, and it's not given in the problem. It's a relationship between variables that we extracted from the context of the problem using logic. And that's the sort of thing that you have to do to be able to solve physics problems. Do I know the initial velocity of 2? I do, because it was dropped from rest, so its initial velocity is 0. Do I know the final velocity of 2? I don't. I know that it's half the speed of 1. Its acceleration, it's in free fall, so it's also equal to negative g. The time, uh, I don't know. So at this point, I'm going to make another decision. I'm going to call the speed that the second particle has to be v. And because I know that the final speed of particle 1 is twice that, so that's 2v. Now remember, I know the relationships between the speed. Velocity is a vector, so I have to go back to the diagram to assign the direction of the velocity. And so the vo when they collide, the velocity of the first ball is up, so it's positive, And the velocity of the second ball is down, so it's negative. And so again, that information I extract from the context of the problem as well as my coordinate system. I have a lot of things that I know and don't know. I know that these equations apply to this problem, so I'm going to start using these to see how I can establish relationships between them. Let's just look at the first equation, which is the final velocity is equal to the uh, initial velocity of 1 plus the acceleration times time. And we also have that the final velocity of 2 is equal to the initial velocity of 2, which is 0, plus the acceleration times time. And that's interesting. So this is equal to 2 times speed v, and the final velocity of 2 is equal to negative v. But let's go on. I, I want to find position. I don't have equations for positions yet. The way I look at it, I'm still sort of in brainstorming stage. I, I'm just sort of seeing how these relationships work with each other. So the final position of particle 1, which is x, is equal to its initial position, which is 0, plus its initial velocity, times time, plus 1 half its acceleration, times time squared. Really, this is the time interval, but I know that the time interval is just equal to this t, the final time. And the final position of particle 2, which is also x, is equal to its initial position, which is h, plus its initial velocity times time, which is 0, plus uh, 1 half a t squared. These two are the same parameter, x, which means the right side of these equations are equal to each other. If I set these two equations equal to each other, and the 1 half a t squareds cancel, I get h is equal to v1 i t. So I, I would think for a minute to see what exactly that means. It means that the time between the initial launch and the collision, the time to go from here to here, is the same as the time it would have taken the first ball at its initial velocity to travel the entire distance h if there weren't any acceleration. This is the zero acceleration equation. Distance is velocity times time. I think that's, that's kind of interesting. I might not have guessed that originally. If I look back at these two and combine them, I get twice the velocity is equal to velocity 1 initial plus at. If I substitute at from the second equation, at is equal to negative v. So this tells me that my initial velocity is equal to 3v. So let's go back and bring in our third expression. Our third expression says that our initial velocity squared, our final velocity squared, sorry, for 1 is, is equal to our initial velocity squared plus 2 times a times the position difference for particle 1. And the position, the, the displacement, is x mi minus 0. So that's just x. And our final velocity for 2 is equal to the initial velocity, which is 0, plus twice the acceleration, 
times its displacement, and 2, the displacement is the final minus the initial, its final is x, and its initial is h. And so now that I have expressions for my initial velocity and my final velocity, I think I can substitute into these equations to get a relationship between x and h. Let's go ahead and do that. Using our first expression, I have uh, 2v squared, which is the final velocity, is equal to the initial velocity, which is 3v squared, minus 2gx. I've substituted in a is equal to negative g. And then for the second equation, I have the final velocity, which is v squared, is equal to a negative 2g x minus h. If I just solve here, this gives me uh, 4v squared is equal to 9v squared minus 2gx. And here we have v squared is equal to minus 2gx plus 2gh. And I think I want to solve, I can solve this now for v squared. If I substitute that into here for v squared, I eliminate v squared, and I'm left with x and h, and I should be able to find what the position that they hit, x relative to h. So if I solve this, this gives me 5v squared is equal to 2gx, or v squared is equal to 2 fifths gx. So that's equal to minus 2gx plus 2gh. If I bring this to the other side, this is 2 fifths gx plus 2gx is equal to 2gh. Well, first, look, the g's cancel. 2 is 10 fifths, so that gives me 12 fifths x is equal to 2h, and then cr I can cross multiply, and x over h is equal to 5 sixths. Right, I can also rewrite this. x is equal to 5 sixths h. And so the fraction of the height where the balls hit is 5 sixths the distance from which the first ball was dropped.